Amen. Preach it, um, <laughs> You know, I, I actually asked the kids to do that sermon. Ah, uh, that sermon. That <laughs> song before my sermon. Amen. And so you, you can figure out figure out what the name of the lesson is. It's hmm and hmm. <laughs> First point hmm, second point hmm. Uh, but it is deep and wide, man. Uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. And, you know, I was thinking about, you know, it is Easter, of course, the cross. And when you think about deep and wide, I, it, it reminded me of this passage in Ephesians, I'm sorry, chapter 3, actually. Ephesians chapter 3, in verse 14, and it says, For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Come on. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Come on. And I love this passage because literally it talks about the incredible love of Christ, amen. amen. The love of God. And it says that, man, God's love is high. It's long. It's deep. And it's wide, amen. Yeah. amen. And when I think about, well, what really shows that, I can't help but think of the cross, amen. See, and I love it because Paul right here says that, I hope and I pray that you may be rooted and established in love. Yes. So see, for us to be rooted and established in this love, we need to know about this love. Amen? amen. And I pray that today as we study out a little bit of the cross, amen, we can really get a deeper knowledge, a deeper understanding about this love so that then we can share this love with others and impact those around us. Amen? amen. Come on. Amen. Let's go. To Philippians chapter 1. Uh, so excitedly as a church, we started studying out the book of Philippians. Amen? So let's flip on over to Philippians <laughs> chapter 1. I got a milk it for all this work. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was awesome. Of course, uh, last week we, we, did, we didn't read a lot too much of Philippians. We only went through the first 11 scriptures because we got a little background about it. Amen? Mm -hmm. Of course, the Philippians is known as the Epistle of Christian Joy, amen? amen? Written by Paul while he was under house arrest in Rome. And so, think about it, this guy was incarcerated, yet he spoke so much about joy, amen? amen. See, his circumstances did not dictate how he felt, amen? Come on, bro. Uh, the book of Philippians was written about 10 to 12 years after the church in Philippi was started, which we learn about that in Acts chapter 16, amen? And it was awesome, right? This was the first church to uh, be started in Europe, amen? In European soil, which was exciting, right? And, and we got to see the beginning stages of it. You know, uh, when we studied out Philippians 1, the first 11 verses, there was this emphasis that we read about on prayer, right? And so we talked about praying for partners in the gospel, right? Other believers working hand in hand, right? Pray to do God's work and to discern what is best as we're going about doing that work, right? And so we talked about that, hey, as servants of the Lord, what do we need to depend on? Prayer, amen. Right? We need to rely on prayer. Now, you know, for partners in the gospel, it was awesome because we saw, again, that, that very small beginning of the church in Philippi, but it, it became a pillar church that literally, I mean, it got a whole book in the Bible, which is pretty awesome, Amen. Uh, we saw that they didn't have a lot of conversions like in other churches, but literally thousands were at it. But right here, they started very small. They started with Lydia, right, who was a, a pretty powerful woman, right? She was a businesswoman, yeah. uh, and uh, she was the first conversion. Uh, and then after that, for sure, we know that the Philippian jailer was, uh, became a believer as well, right, and was converted, which is awesome. 
And, uh, you know, as we study out these conversions and these first converts to the Philippian church, uh, we see a lot of Christian characteristics that, you know, the Bible teaches us. I mean, we, we look at uh, literally Christian households being started. Because it was not just Lydia that was converted, but it was Lydia and her whole household, yeah. right? It wasn't just the jailer, but it was the jailer and his whole family, yeah. amen? Yeah. And so we see the beginning, right, of Christian households taking place. Mm -hmm. uh, we also see the beginning of Christian hospitality, right? Yep. As after they were baptized, what did Lydia and the jailer do? They welcomed them to their yeah. home. Mm -hmm. And literally, they just served them, which is pretty awesome. We also see how much equality was preached by God through the Gospel of Philippians. Because, think about this, right? If it was written by man, right, and it was made by man, what man would have the first conversion be a woman? Wow. Not just a woman, but a very prominent woman. Right. I, if it was me, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to make it a, a guy's thing, right? I'm going I'm to talk about the jailer first, if anything, right? But God said, no, I value women. Come on. And the equality of women. Amen. 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 Come on. Uh, we also see the value whether rich or poor, right? One of the people that we were introduced, we don't know if she was fully converted, but we know that Paul, right, there's a slave girl that was walking around disturbing the peace, actually saying the right thing, like, hey, these guys can tell you how to be saved. But she kept doing that over and over and over and over and over, day in, day out. And Paul got a little, you know, annoyed, and he said, okay, in the name of God, I command the Spirit to get out. And it does. Right? And right here we see that no longer is she, you know, uh, subject to the spirit in her, and we see the power that God had in her life. And so again, this was a slave girl. And so we see it doesn't matter whether you're rich or you're poor. Whether you're a man or a woman, God wants us all to be equal in his kingdom. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on. And he really loves not just one person, but all. Amen? Mm -hmm. And so we're going to continue here in Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to pick it up in verse 12. Come on. Bible reads, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So what is he talking about? Well, the fact that he's been incarcerated, right? He's under house arrest. He's going through this trial. And so the first point that we're going to talk about today is that deep pain advances the gospel. Wow. Verse 13. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. Mm -hmm. He was just fired up that people were hearing about Jesus Christ. Yep. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Mm -hmm. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Come on. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yeah, what shall I choose? I do not know. I mean, he's conflicted right here, right? I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, make it to heaven, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you, again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a matter worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm 
in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it is it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer wow. for Him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. You see, deep pain advances the gospel. You know, Paul, right, he just goes in through all, he goes and, and shares all the challenges that he's going through, amen? He's like, guys, remember, I, I'm incarcerated right here, I'm under house arrest. So it's become a little challenging to be out and about preaching the gospel. Guys, there's people that while I'm incarcerated, they're preaching Christ, but in, for false motives. You know, and then I hear that you guys are going through similar hardships that I'm going through. You know, and he really can sympathize with them. And I understand the deep pains that you're going through. But you got to remember, it all serves a purpose mm -hmm. to advance the gospel. Mm -hmm. See, Paul's chains, the whole purpose was all to give God glory and to really advance his gospel. To help other people see his life, see his circumstances, and be inspired how he still can remain faithful to his God. Yep, come on. I mean, think about this. I mean, literally, by him living a life as a disciple of Jesus, by him standing firm in the midst of these trials, by him being joyful, because that's what he's talking about, right? I mean, the guards are like, what are you doing? Like, dude, you're incarcerated. You're in jail. And, and, and just that different spirit can really help to preach to these guards. Amen. And although Paul may not be able to go out and preach to others, but then the guards can talk amongst themselves. Then they can spread the gospel themselves as they talk to the people. Like, this guy's in jail. You know, he's so joyful. I don't get it. What is it about this Jesus that helps him to find great joy? Come on. You see, the reality is that his hardships, his pain could have hindered him advancing the gospel. I mean, he could have said, well, you know, I'm in jail, so I, I can't meet any new people. How can I share my faith, right? How can I talk to Jesus about, uh, to others about Jesus? But he didn't let it hinder it. He got created, creative, and he allowed God to work through this difficult situation. See, do you believe that the things that happen to you, they serve a purpose? Our purpose of advancing the gospel. Wow. Yeah. See, how you handle deep pain, how you handle hardships, can be a testimony to those around you. Wow. They can say, man, what is it? Why are you so joyful? Didn't this just happen to you? And you're like, yes, but I find my joy in my God. Come on. And not in my circumstances. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that his life inspired his brothers. Amen. In verse 14, it says, Because of my chains, because of my deep pains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Now think about this, right? Because they could have thought, man, he preached the gospel, and he got incarcerated. If I preach the gospel, what's going to happen? Yeah. That could happen to me too. And they're probably remembering, you know, the other apostles, you know, Stephen getting martyred, and they're like, I don't know about that. But it's a man, they, they found courage, and they went on preaching <coughs> a gospel, which I think yeah. is exciting. Yeah. Now, I'll be honest, I've read the scripture countless times. And you know how I read it? It's like this. Because of my chains, the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. And somehow I always miss the fact that it says most of the brothers, mm. meaning not all the brothers. Right. See, and that showed me that, hey, we all go through similar trials, but how we handle it depends on us. Yeah, mm -hmm. wow. We can completely see something that mm -hmm. can bring us great fear, and we can be stunted and do nothing about it. Or we can overcome that fear and be courageous men and women of God. Come on. Yeah. Knowing that no matter how hard, our God will see us through it. Amen? See, we need to be men and women like these guys. The, the most part. And it was also the most of them. That they just preached the word courageously, no matter the circumstances, no matter the consequences. Mm -hmm. 
See, for me, I realize that our circumstances should never dictate the actions that we take in a negative light. Right? Our, even though there are bad circumstances, does not mean that we need to do bad things. That we need to turn to sin. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It should inspire us to be even more faithful in our yeah, God. Come on. You know, in verse 19, of course, Paul uh, is talking about his hardships. And it says, in the second half of verse 18, Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, even though I'm going through deep pain. Amen? For I know that through your prayers, so he's talking to, again, the saints, the disciples, the Christians in the church in Philippi, and the help given by the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. And you see that Paul's hardships caused the church to do what? Turn to God in prayer. Why? Because they realize there's nothing we can do for Paul. We can't go in there and break him free. Right? We can't take him out of jail. And so they realize there's nothing we can do. But you know what? We can pray to our God and he can do something. Right. Come on. Because he has all the power in the world. Again, we see this incredible emphasis on prayer, a dependence, a reliance Amen. on their God. Come on. See, for you, do you rely on God when you realize that things are out of your control? Mm. Or do you fight to take control of it? Again, they, don't, they didn't just rely on prayer, but they, they knew God was going to work, and they said, of course, he says that uh, in verse 19, through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit, right? That Holy Spirit, that little power of God. And he knew that God is the one that can move in Paul's life. For us, we need to realize that God is the one that can move. So we need to be deep in prayer for ourselves, but for one another as well. Man, through any on. deep pains that we may be going through. Yeah. You know, my wife shared uh, about the little hardship we went through with the car, right, man? <laughs> and so, you know, it reminded me of this scripture in Romans chapter 8. Come on. You know, if you know me, I love to be in control. And let's be honest, many of us do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no one likes to be out of control from their own situation, right? <laughs> and in Romans chapter 8, it reminded me of this scripture, especially when we're going through hard times. In verse 28 it says, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those mm-hmm. who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You know, and this is a scripture I need to hold on to dearly. That in all things, even uh, situations that cause great pain, deep pain, that are challenging. I mean, do I truly believe that God is working for my good? Even when it does not make sense to me. You know, this situation with the car. For me, it made no sense. I did nothing wrong. I'm not out there getting drunk, right, and getting in an accident, right? It's not like I, I parked bad in the middle of the street where someone came and I was like, man, that's totally my fault. I was like parked like three feet off of the, yeah. you know, the, I was parked in my driveway. Yes. <laughs> I did what I was supposed to do. <laughs> Why would I think a car's got to come into my driveway and just bam, <laughs> whack me? <laughs> I'm like, God, help me understand how is this is for my own good because uh, I, don't, I don't see it. They weren't even nice. They didn't leave their information nope. so they could pay for it. <laughs> you know, it was like, I'm like, hey man, now I got a contact. I can share my faith with them. I can advance the gospel. And, you know, $500 or $300, hey man, doesn't have to take out of my account, especially during missions time, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> and I was just like, God, can, can you just help me understand how this is for my own good? And then that's when I need to go and pray to my God and be like, yes, please. Give me some direction. You know, and it was also, uh, awesome. Sasha, you know, she's a little bit more spiritual than I am, you know. And so that night, she's like, wait, don't you do lift? Because it happened on a Thursday night. And don't you do lift on a Friday night? I'm like, yeah, I usually do, you know. She's like, man, what if you were going to get in an accident and God's just stopping that? Come on. I was just like, Good you know, it, it's, it's exactly right. It's the things that we don't know that will happen. Right. Because they don't happen. Yeah. That's right. It's like. Why, why if God is just protecting you? Because the reality was no one was in the car. So that's a blessing in itself, amen? Yeah, yeah. Right? No one was hurt. 
Only Tori, our little car, eh, man? She's, she's all right. She's, she's, uh, she's running good. She's a Toyota Camry, Tori. You know? uh, right? And so, for me, I was just like, I don't even know what God is doing, but God is working. And then, uh, you know, it was awesome. Like, uh, you know, they, they had to come and take it to the auto body shop. And so, and it was funny, like, uh, the guy that came, he, he's from the Bronx. And so my wife's talking, hey, we're from the Bronx, you know? And, and we're just making that connection. I'm like, maybe... God wants him to come out of church. Yeah. They're like, okay, maybe I got to get a rental car. Maybe he wants someone at Enterprise to come to church. And then I'm just thinking, okay, I know that God works for the good, and he wants me to advance the gospel. So obviously he wants me to meet somebody yeah. to come out to church to study the Bible. And for me, I may not even know the type of impact that it has, but that has to be my mentality. Come on, yeah, come on. God always works yep. for the good. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 1. You know, the reality, it costs, some deep pain in my wallet to, you know, be out $300. But I know that it's going to help to advance the gospel. You know, Philippians chapter 1, in uh, verse 20, it says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body whether by life or by death. Yeah. And so again, he just finished talking about the hardships, right? Yeah. And now he says, I'm going through all these hardships, but I eagerly expect and I hope, and I'm, I'm excited to see what is God going to do through this hardship. And so for me, through this hardship, I'm like, okay, I don't know what God is going to do, but I'm eagerly expecting to see what he's going to make happen. And it's cool, it reminded me of a, a scripture in Romans 8. Uh, we can turn to actually back there. In Romans 8, in verse 19, and, you know, when I looked at the Greek, uh, this eagerly expectation, or an eager expectation means watching with outstretched head, with the attention concentrated on one object, and turn away from all others. And so, you know, you've ever experienced this, like, when something happens, all of a sudden, like, let's say, you know, you're in the middle of the street, and, like, you hear, like, a car crash, or you just hear something, what do people do? Like, all of a sudden, they, like, get up. They stretch and they're like, they're trying to see what happened, right? And they're stretching out. And that's what happens for us, right? It's like this eagerness to see what is going to happen next, right? And that's what happens right here. This is a hope that we can have. To see like, wow, okay, something hard, uh, bad is happening. Okay, what is God going to do next? And we can just stand on up, get our you know, heads high, so we can see God work, guys. And it reminded me of the scripture in Romans 8, verse 18. And it says, because, you know, what was this hope that Paul was talking about, though? Like, what was he eagerly expecting to happen? Well, it says, I consider that our present sufferings, our deep pain currently, are not worth comparing with the glory that will, re be, uh, that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, amen, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons. The redemption of our bodies. For in this we hope, uh, for in uh, this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? Mm. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Yeah. See, and there's this eager expectation for what is to come, which uh, Paul lets us know is what? Making it to heaven. Mm. To be adopted at God's sons, as God's daughters. And you see, this is the hope that must inspire us. This is the hope that will help us continuing to have a joy no matter what we're going through, no matter what deep pains we're experiencing. You see, Paul says, my current sufferings, they're worth nothing compared to the glory of being with my Father yeah. in heaven. Come on. See, is this your output in life? Is this your view when it comes to your relationship with God? That no matter what you go through while you're on earth, how painful it may be, it must draw you near to God. 
And you need to be reminded of, there's something better to come. Heaven. Eternal peace. See, if you don't have this output, I believe it's you don't have this hope. Mm. You know, when I, I looked at uh, the Greek uh, for hope, it had a few definitions, and, and I was actually very inspired. We can go back to Philippians 1. But it said two things. Number one, an expectation of evil, and it was defined as fear. But then number two, an expectation of good, that's hope. You see, when we go through challenges or any situation, we're going to have expectations of how it's going to turn out. If we give in to our fear, then we have an expectation of something evil, something bad happening. Mm. But if we find hope in our God, then we are always going to be joyful. Amen? Why? Because we have an expectation of something good happening. We have a hope. And that's what hope is. It's a joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. We are confident that no matter what happens on earth, we, when we die, we're going to be with our Heavenly Father in Heaven. You know, and this is actually, is awesome, the, the hope that uh, Paul talks about it. In verse 19, in uh, Philippians chapter 1, he says, uh, Well, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Mm -hmm. And if you look at your footnotes, that can be translated as my salvation. Mm -hmm. And so Paul knew all this hardship is to help me make it to heaven. Yeah. It's worth it. If that's what I need to go through to stay close to my God, it's worth it. Because I know for the rest of eternity, I'll be at peace mm -hmm. with my God. See, our expectation, our hope, cannot be on things of this earth, but on making it to heaven. Amen? Amen. You know, verse 22, Paul continues, and this is, I love this, when he gets into this little, uh, little uh, conversation with himself. He's like, man, you know, I, I want to go to heaven. I, I mean, that's far better than anything, but at the same time, I know if, if I stay here on earth, it's going to benefit you. It's going to benefit those that I can impact. It's going to benefit those that I can share the gospel and can advance in their lives and they can have a relationship with God and they too can join me in heaven. And he was battling between the two, amen? And so we, we learned that just like Paul, hey, it's far better if we all died a day and made it to heaven. That'd be awesome. We finished the race. It says, hey, if we're still alive today, it's because God is in control. And guess what? He's not done with us. Right. That's right. He wants us to continue to change, continue to mature, and then continue to have an impact on those around us. Come on. You know, Paul realized, if I'm alive, it's for a few reasons. And so if we're alive, it's for a few reasons as well. Number one, it's because it means that you have some fruitful labor to accomplish. Amen? Mm -hmm. Right? He didn't say just to do work, just to do labor. Fruitful labor, meaning it's going to produce something. Mm -hmm. So you've got to ask yourself, okay, is the work that I'm doing, is the labor that I'm doing producing anything for Jesus? Wow. Right? You know, we, we talk about uh, we need to, you know, go after the fruits of the Spirit, amen, mm -hmm. and changing our character, right? But there's also the fruit of making disciples, of helping other people become Christians, Right? And so you got to ask yourself, how is it going being fruitful? You know, are people looking at your life and like, I've seen you repent of whatever set of choice for you is. I've really seen you grow in your pride. I've really seen you grow in your discipline. I've really seen you grow in your evangelism. You know, how's it going in the fruit of, of helping someone else become a disciple? Of helping them find this deep, this wide love that God Brings wow. through the cross. You know, that's what it's all about. If we're alive today, it's about fruitful labor. Number two, again, it's helping others progress in their faith. And so it's not just helping someone to get faith, but then to progress in their faith, right? And so that you got to continue to stay in there so that we can grow and become more faithful. Because the reality is, it doesn't become easier as we grow older in our walk with God. Come on. The challenges get Harder and harder, so our faith needs to get bigger and bigger. Amen. To the point that, well, number three, our joy is overflowing. Mm. And so literally, you know, some of us may not be joyful, and we have the privilege, the opportunity to get in their lives, bring faith into them, and then help bring their joy back in God, mm. 
and allow it to overflow. Meaning it's going to come out of them so much that it's going to pour into those around them. And again, joy is the, uh, one of the key things that we find in Philippians. And we see just Paul going back to it. right? He will rejoice. And he says, man, we need to help each other be overflowing with joy. Amen. See, do you know how your brothers and sisters are doing? And uh, what are you doing to go help them to be overflowing yeah. in the joy for the relationship with God? Yeah. You know, I think one of the most challenging scriptures from this uh, chapter, we find in verse 29. It says, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for Him. You know, and, and I saw this, and I'm like, the reality is that so many of us want to believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. right. But not many of us want to suffer for yeah. it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's sad to, you know, what a lot of churches preach. You just got to believe in Jesus, believe it. Amen, that's part of it. But are you willing to not just believe, but to suffer for it? Yeah, come on. To allow that deep pain to challenge you. To mold you into the man, into the woman that God desires you to become. So that you can advance the gospel. You know, even Tisha sharing today, she's like, man, she, you know, she had to make a decision to make Jesus king of her life. Come on, Tisha. Lord of her life. But see, what most people want is, hey, I want Jesus to be my savior, but not my Lord, not my king. Mm -hmm. I want him to save me, but I, then I want to live the way I want to live. Mm -hmm. Instead of living the way he calls me to live. See, what's amazing is that how we handle pain, guys, how we handle difficult situations will show others that we truly are believers. And it will be a testimony to them. And this is one powerful way that we can advance the gospel. Because remember, this is what Paul did. He advanced the gospel even though he went through deep pain, through deep, uh, very intense challenges. Now, I was studying this out. One of the, there's a statement that a commentary made, and, and it really stuck out to me, and I really want to live this out, amen? And it said, faith in Christ is the gift of God. Can we all agree to that? Yes. yes. Amen. But so is the fellowship of his suffering. Mm. See, that's a gift as well. But, you know, I was thinking about this. You ever got a gift you didn't like? <laughs> you know, what, what am I going to do with this? If it's Christmas, they're like, well, maybe I can like regift this to someone else. You know what I'm saying? That's and then you, you're just trying to get rid of it because you don't like it. You don't see a purpose for it. And I feel like a lot of times when we get the suffering, we're like, I don't like this, Jesus. I want to give this gift to someone else. <laughs> and we're not seeing the privilege that it is, the gift it is. Literally, guys, we're, we're being just like Jesus. Yeah. You know, the cross wasn't an easy thing. He suffered greatly. But because of his suffering, he gave us the opportunity to have life in Christ. Mm. See, suffering can bring incredible opportunities. Our suffering can bring incredible opportunities in our lives, but in the lives of those around us. We need to realize that suffering is not a burden, but a privilege. Mm. You know, for me, uh, some of you know uh, uh, my testimony, amen? I'm going to share a little bit more. You can read the article. <coughs> but I, it helped me to think, even before I share about myself, but about our sister, Kathy Hotsey. I mean, so, you know, when, when we met her, she was suffering with stage 4 cancer. Mm -hmm. And really, she was battling, we just found out, uh, a cancer through about the last five years. And if you've ever met someone that's battled with cancer, it's, it's a fight. It brings a, a lot of deep pain to them, but also to those around them, mm -hmm. you know. But literally, guys, you realize this is the deep pain she had to go through to see her need for God. Yeah. Yeah. For many years, she believed in God, but she didn't really connect with the suffering for Christ. And this is the pain she had to go through to finally turn her heart to say, I want to live for Christ. Amen. And, you know, to see someone who was suffering physically not able to do much to literally do whatever possible to jump into the waters of baptism I mean, we're like okay we're gonna have to get a step stool because she can and she like no step stool she, i'm not waiting she just got in there and we have like i guess she's doing it let's go guys. Come on. and just the joy the peace yeah. 
that she was able to add. I don't know the family said we're so grateful that she was able to find peace when she met you guys. Amen. But she had to go suffer before she got to taste that peace. Yeah. Come on. You know, for me, I didn't grow up religious. Uh, I was agnostic, so I believe in a higher power. I just well, I was very anti-religious, uh, religion, any religion. I just like Christians. Uh, and, and really, it's because I just saw the hypocr hypocrisy in the world, and I'm like, dude, you want me to do something you're not even doing. Why would I do that? You know? Like, you don't even believe in this. I don't see the power that it has in your life. Forget about it. Right? And so I never did. And so, for me, what caused me the pain and, and stop, uh, caused me to go after uh, searching after God was my wife. When we were dating, uh, as a dating couple, we had been dating for two years. And, you know, at that time, she was in, uh, even though she grew up religious, uh, she was in very active in it. And we have a bit, we had a, from the world's perspective, a very awesome relationship. We didn't cheat on each other. We didn't really fight. But when we really got down to the heart of it, I mean, there was a lot of deceit on my part, a lot of manipulation. Uh, you know, she wanted to wait until marriage before she had sex, and I just did whatever for her to have sex with me. And then continually after that. You know, and, and so literally, I mean, it was just sin on both sides. But then she started studying the Bible. She saw her life wasn't matching the scriptures. And she said, I need to go after my God. Come on. And she did that. She studied the Bible, and she got baptized. And she kept encouraging me to come out, and I was like, nah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And then before she got baptized, she's like, I'm going to have to break up because our relationship is not pleasing to God, and, and you're not helping me to stay close to God. And I said, whatever. You do whatever you got to do. I was like, oh, macho. I don't care. <laughs> Fast forward a week. I don't even think it was a week. <laughs> like three days. I'm at my job. And I'm in tears. <coughs> calling Melissa. I'm like, come back. Come back. And I just felt the deep pain of losing a relationship. And you're like, Raph, why? Because I had only, to be honest, Melissa's the second girl I ever dated. Um, and I dated a girl in college. High school. High school sweetheart. I liked her. She was a freshman. Didn't ask her out till like, senior or about to graduate. And we started dating. Dated for, like, two years also. And then she ends up studying abroad, and she ends up dumping me <laughs> for another guy. She was in Italy. And I remember that pain. And the suffering. The struggle. And then I remember talking to Melissa, and, and, and I was just so ticked off. And I'm like, great, the same thing's happening again. You're leaving me for another guy, this guy Jesus. <laughs> At least the other guy, I mean, he's far when we talk. <laughs> this Jesus guy, uh, Jesus, what, where are you? <laughs> but it did, I mean, guys, it was like painful for me to lose that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And then I started to wonder, what am I doing with my life? And then, to be honest, I came to get her out of the church. My motives were not pure. But as the scripture says, hey, well, the false motives, you know, what matters is that Christ is preached, and when people hear Christ, they will repent. Yep. Mm -hmm. By the grace of God, God softened my heart. I was able to study the Bible, understand what she did, and I too was baptized. Come on, girl. <laughs> you know, shortly after we had started dating, got married, and married, and all. <laughs> but I had to go through deep pain yeah. to see my need for God. See, Deep pain should help us to see our need for God. Wow. And cause us to turn away from Him. The reality is that when we go through deep pain, we turn to drugs. We turn to alcohol. We turn to sex. We turn to anything that will help us find comfort momentarily. Yep. But that's the key. It's momentarily. Right. It'll never fully fulfill us. The only thing that can bring us lifelong comfort Lifelong peace is a relationship with Jesus. Amen. You know, in Isaiah 53, you don't have to turn there. Verse 5 says, But he, Jesus, this is a prophecy about Jesus, was pierced for our sins, our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. You see, only the cross can bring healing to our lives. But let us allow the deep pains to advance the gospel in our lives, but also in the lives of those around us. Yes. Let's finish off here in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, if you have any encouragement, because you know, I know you're struggling, amen, going through all these hardships, from being united with Christ in the waters of baptisms. 
if any comfort from his love shown at the cross, if any fellowship with the spirits, if any tenderness, compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, be one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility wow. consider others better than yourselves. Wow. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. I mean, the most cruel way to die. Literally, a death that was really done to criminals. Therefore, verse 9, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow yep. in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Our second and final point, unity is needed to have worldwide impact. Come on. Come on. I mean, through this scriptures, we find unity being preached. Yes, come on. Guys, as believers, we need to strive for unity. The reality is, sad what Satan has done. How many different denominations he's allowed to come out? How many different forms of how to be saved? How many different forms of how to follow Jesus? And there's just one way! Come on. And we find it in the scriptures. Yes. But of course, Satan is a master deceiver. Yep. And what better way than to disunify us as believers? Yep. That's why the scripture says we need to fight to keep the unity. Amen? Yep. And we need to dig into the scriptures and make sure that we're unified when it comes to what it means to be saved, how, what it means to live for God, amen? I mean, think about this. He calls us to be <coughs> like-minded, to think the same. You're like, that's impossible. We're all individuals. We all think differently. How can we think the same? Think like Jesus. <laughs> he calls us to have the same love. Mm -hmm. But how can we love? I mean, we, we all love differently. We all feel love differently. Mm -hmm. How can we have that same love? And this is important because in John 13, 34 to 35, Jesus says, hey, you know, as I've loved you, you must love one another so that the world will know that you're my disciples. Yep, come on. So you can have that worldwide impact. But see, we need to love as Jesus loved us. And of course, that love was shown at the cross. But how can we have that same love? How can we have that one spirit, one purpose? Well, if we have one standard that comes from the Bible. Amen. See, if our standard is the scriptures, we truly can unified. Come on. Yeah. But you see, to be unified, one thing needs to happen. We need to be humble. Yeah. Amen. See, unity implies humility. It is pride, it is self-conceit that leads to strife and debate. It leads to us being disunified. And what we need to do is we need to die to ourselves. Come on. So that we can finally get surrendered to the will of God and be unified with one another. I mean, this is what Jesus did. Jesus had his own will. If you read it, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, Jesus died for me. He wanted, no, he didn't. He did not want to die for you. Read it, Matthew 26, 36 and 39. Mm -hmm. He had to go to God in prayer and wrestle. He says, man, God, if there's any way, may this cup be taken from me. Yeah, the cup on. of your wrath, taken upon the sins of the world. He didn't want to go, but he prayed for an hour. And then he prayed for some more time. And then he prayed again. Three times he had to go. Right. Until he got his heart right. And it says, not my will be done, but your will be done. Yeah. Yeah. He needed to die to himself. Amen. And he needed to be unified with his Father in heaven yeah. Yeah. Come on. to do his will. See, for us, we need to die to our desires. Come on. So that we can fulfill God's desires wow. in our lives and Come in the on. lives of those around us. Come on. I mean, Jesus is the ultimate example of humility. It says that he was God, verse 6, yet he emptied himself. He made himself nothing. And he became a man like you and I. 
He literally stripped himself of all divinity just to be fully human. Come on. See, the question we need to ask ourselves, are we willing to do the same? To imitate Jesus, as verse 5 calls us that, that our attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus, meaning we need to imitate him. Amen. And are we going after dying to ourselves? You know, I can't help but think about our sister, Sharon Grohman. Come on. You know, um... <laughs> We had a little going away party for her, so she's actually uh, going to go to Cambodia. Yeah. Uh, and, and really, she's going to go out there to preach the word. And at the going away party, I, you know, my wife and I don't know too much about her because every time we've moved, she's never really been where. She's lived in, like, New York City, but we weren't there when she lived mm -hmm. there. And, you know, we, so we've gotten to know her a little bit the times that she's visited. So it was great to hear the stories about her. And, you know, one thing that I, just people kept saying is, like, just if you knew this woman before Jesus... And after, it's like a complete transformation. Mm -hmm. And this is a woman that would not leave her house if, like, snowflakes were coming down. <laughs> you know, if you're like, I think a sister, I think it's Terry, right? She would have to drive her, yep. you know, to places. And, and she, like, so quiet, right, would not really talk to anybody. And she just allowed Jesus to transform her. Yeah. The cross to motivate her to be like Jesus. And throughout the year, she's grown to the point that now she lives in New York City. Yeah. From Syracuse. I wanted to be in Syracuse. <laughs> to literally live in, in the Big Apple. Yeah. So she actually lives in Jersey, but she, she does a lot in New York City. Yeah. She drives in New York City. You drive wow. in New York City, you know, you're putting your life on the line, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, literally, she's going. She's giving up the comforts. She's not, you know, a spring chicken. Nope. She could just retire, take it easy. She says, no, I want to go to Cambodia. Mm -hmm. Come on. To third world country. Mm -hmm. Come on. To preach the gospel. Come on. To bring the cross to people that don't know about Jesus. Amen. She has to die to her desires and take upon the desires of Jesus. Amen. And I think she's an excellent example yes. of yes. what true humility does yes. for Jesus. You know, the reality is, we need to die to ourselves and go and preach the gospel. We need to die to ourselves and give it all so others can go and preach the gospel. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I call us to, let's sacrifice financially. And whatever you don't have, sacrifice it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even what you don't have, just give it. Yeah. Come on. If you don't have, find someone else that does. Mm -hmm. Give it. Give it all to see people find a relationship with God. Yes. Amen. Let's finish off in 1 John chapter 2. Bring it in for a close. The reality is that if you say that you're a disciple, if you say that you're a Christian, what you're saying is, I want to be just like Jesus. Yes. I want to be just like Christ. I want to live just like Him. And so if you do, well, let's see what the Scriptures have to say. Come on. In verse 3 it says, we know that we have come to know Him if we obey His commands. So right there alone, that's pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. You can say you know Jesus because you go to a church, but that's not enough biblically. Wow, come on. You only truly know Jesus, you only truly know God if you actually obey His commands. Wow. Verse 4. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what com he commands, is a liar. liar. Oh. So, I'm not calling you a liar. <laughs> God is calling you a liar. Oh. And that is what you're doing this morning. <coughs> calling yourself a Christian, but saying, no, I don't live according to it. And the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, amen, there's hope. <laughs> God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in Him. Whoever claims to live in Him must walk as Jesus did. Amen. See, this is not a suggestion. This is a requirement. Amen. If you call yourself a Christian, if you call yourself a disciple of Jesus, then are you walking according to Jesus' standard? Come on. If not, just repent and don't be a liar. Amen. You see, Jesus pleased not himself. He sought not the high places of the world. He did not choose a life of ease, 
comfort, pleasure. He lived in care for the souls of all, not just some. The standard is very high, above us, out of our reach. But it is the end of which the high calling of the Christian points. It should be the object of all the longing of our hearts. To know Christ, to love Christ, to live just like Christ. Amen? Amen. Come on. Amen. Like Him in the outward life of obedience. Amen. Like Him in the inner life of holy thinking. Come on. I want to challenge us this morning. Live like Christ. See, to live like Christ, you need to know how He lived. You need to know how He walked. To so study the Bible. As someone that invited you out, let's dig into the scriptures. Let's see Jesus' life. And let's see in what areas I'm not walking like Jesus. Because I don't want to be a liar. Wow, come on. And I want to look at that hope. And wait in eager expectation. Yeah. till Jesus calls me home. So this morning, let us meditate on the deep and the white love that comes through the cross. And let us remember his sacrifice. And sacrifice ourselves so that others can have life. And to God be all the glory.